All right, we're recording now, and let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you the glory, the honor, the praise tonight. We want to lift you up. We first, as we contemplate who you are and what you've done for us, we recognize that we are sinners. I am a sinner. We're all sinners. We've all sinned and broken your commandments, Father God. Every day, even today, we've sinned, and we just ask forgiveness for that sin. We ask that your spirit would give us the strength to do what's right. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that covers that sin. And we don't, we don't um, take that, that sacrifice lightly. We don't want to take advantage of that sacrifice, Father God. So cleanse us and forgive us and, and know our heart that we want to do what's right, Father God. As we study your word in this prayer, this, this great prayer of, of Hannah, may we understand the truths and may we apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things in faith alone. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me go ahead. Amen. And here we go. So we are in, uh, if you can turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're working along in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to read it one more time just to, to reorient ourselves. Let us go ahead and read and I'll just read and just follow along. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and rises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointing. Let me just review really quick what we discussed because it's been one week and then we'll work through the passage. I do want to finish this prayer tonight. I do have some, some significance, some significances that I want to bring out and also talk for an outline. So I hope to finish this prayer tonight. Let's go ahead and I'll just quickly review here. So we, we already looked at the, at the preceding context last week. We talked about how the husband of Hannah is Elkanah, and he has two wives. So uh, the text does not promote that. It just states it as a fact. It's neither pro nor, nor it doesn't speak negatively explicit about having two wives. Although we, when you see the rivalry, you can kind of understand <laughs> that Two wives is never a good idea, and it's never, multiple wives is never portrayed positively, and, and there are a lot of negative things, and of course, there's the prohibition against having multiple wives, but in this situation, it's just stated as a fact. He has two wives, but the context reveals that because he has two wives, there's big problems, and so what you have is you have a rivalry between the two. Hannah is the, 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 the faithful wife who is, is holy, and she's faithful to the covenant. She's faithful to, 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 the, to the worship of Israel, the, the, the worship practices of Israel. She's sacrificing the temple. She's praying in the temple. She's carrying out uh, what's supposed to be. And then the other wife, I think it's Penina or uh, Penina, Penina or Penina, Penina. Uh, she is the rival and she, she actually is mocking and, call, uh, and being very disrespectful to, to Hannah and the text actually says that uh, even, you know, even though the, the Lord had closed the womb. So it seems to suggest that she knows the Lord has closed the womb of Hannah, and, and yet she's still ridiculing her. 
And then the context concludes with Hannah's request being answered. And she has this son who she gives back to the Lord. This the son will be Samuel, which will will open up a whole another um, it'll it'll transition Israel from a judge a, a judge uh, era onto actual the kingship and um, and so this is the opening story of of First Samuel and then we have we have this prayer this prayer of thanksgiving and so we talked about what it means for a heart to that exalts in the Lord that's to be incredibly joyful and the fact that it's God who has, uh, her horn is exalted, which is a symbol of, of pride, of boasting. But, but that's in the context of the Lord. And so it's not her own boasting. She's not boasting in her own. She's, she's boasting in the Lord. And then we also talk about her, uh, my mouth derides my enemies. And really the derision, the word deride, probably is better translated boast. Um, and so... There isn't a one-to-one -one correlation because language doesn't always work that way. So they chose the ride, but the, the, the context really, uh, the idea is that she's boasting over her enemies and what the Lord has done for her. And you have the reason, because of she's rejoicing in her salvation. Okay. And then we were finishing at verse two. Verse two talks about uh, a description of who the Lord is. There is none holy like the Lord. For there is none besides you. And so what we really talked about here was in this, in this category, there's, uh, there's only one person in the category of holy, set apart. That's God. And he's set apart from creation. So really here you see this complete, you have this, this set apart uh, from, from creation. There, there's, there's, there's a dividing line here. Creation is not God. There, there's, there's no connection between God and creation. It, it's completely other. And so Hannah is declaring that. And then the last portion of verse 2, I'll complete this before we go into our, our assignments for verse number 3. But verse number, the last part of verse number 2 is this statement here. You have this, there is no rock like our God. There is no rock like our God. And so this is, this is, this is talking about uh, a state, the type of action is a state of existence. And so the, uh, what's being described is rock. The, the subject is rock. The comparison is nothing compares to, to God. There's no other rock that can be compared to God. So this is a metaphor. Um, this idea of rock here, this is another imagery, right? So you have this imagery here. This is an animal Im imagery, right? Of a large animal with a horn that's standing up strong. And we're going to see this. Even Bethany made the comment in her, in her devotions in the Psalms. It's always talking about the horn being lifted up. And so what often happens is, is that especially in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that physical images, physical different things in nature describe spiritual truths. Okay, and so you're going to see in, in the Psalms, in poetry, so many different uh, images, so many different analogies. And, and, and the whole point of the analogy is to try to teach us about a spiritual truth. And so we have this animal analogy here. And if you see it in action, right? So here in, in San Gerardo, we don't have big animals, right? But we have dogs. And you see a dog when it prances, its, its hair goes back. And the dog is very aggressive, right? If it's protecting its property, if it's very, there's, I've had, Beth and I, we've had to hit several, we'll take our dog, Bon Bon, on a walk. And I've had to hit a dog before because they're so aggressive. There, there's no fear. <laughs> no fear. And, uh, and so what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to bring out is that if you can see those analogies in, nature itself it is just so powerful um and so we have we have two we have two illustrations here Let, let's go and let's look at let's look at this rock metaphor okay let's look at this rock metaphor i want i want to focus in on here now what what kind of rock 
is Jesus or is, is the Lord referring to here? Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, let's do a little bit. We're not going to do this for every verse. I, I do want to focus on rock because Henry brought up uh, this, this observation here that salvation is being mentioned. Okay, so I do want to investigate this word rock. So let's go. The first passage I want to look at is I want to go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. Okay, so yes, great. So this is the song of Moses. Okay, so this is the song of Moses. And this is, this is after the law has been given. This is at the end. Okay, and so Moses, Moses is going to sing this song. At, but we're not going to read the whole, the, whole, the whole song. But I want us to, to have a context as I read this. We're just going to read several verses here. Verse 1. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. Like gentle rain upon the tender grass, and like showers upon the herb. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he okay and then it's going to go into speaking the, the comparison in the song of moses is going to be between god who is the rock who is faithful and and then the people who are who are, have dealt corruptly with him <laughs> and so it's going to be it's going to be going back and forth between a faithful god and faithless people let me let me highlight this word i want to see what this word says here okay so this just means rock okay I was wondering if there was a correlation with mountain. I was wondering if there's a connection with mountain here. Let's go to let's go to uh, 2 Samuel 22, 3. So at, at this point here, the rock in this context, so the so the rock in this context here in, in Deuteronomy 32 in verse 4, 4 to 5, the rock, the image in Deuteronomy is portraying that of steadfastness, right? Steadfastness in what was the example? What was the examples here? The, the examples here were his work is perfect, all his ways are justice, a, a God of faithfulness without iniquity. So it's it's a steadfast rock, and what is he steadfast in? Justice, faithfulness, without sin. A rock never changes, right? It's just there. It's there every day, every week, every month, every year. It never changes, okay? And so there, he's steadfast in what? In justice, in faithfulness, and also in, let's do uh, righteousness. When you're talking about rock, there is no rock like our God. We're using another context to help us to define what, uh, what this word means here. Does everyone understand what we're doing here? We're trying to understand uh, what is the full significance? We're asking the question, what? What's the imagery? What's the specific? What is in the mind of Hannah when she says, there is no rock like our God? We know that she's faithful to the covenant, and rock is, is spelled out in the covenant in, in Deuteronomy 32. He's called the rock, and then he's described. So this is helping us to define what rock means, okay? Everyone's tracking with what, what the, the, what's going on here. I, I probably wasn't as clear as I should have been, okay? And so at least in Deuteronomy 32, the Lord is the rock with reference to what? What's that image? He's steadfast, specifically in justice, faithfulness, and righteousness. So just to take a, a pause and a step back, we talked about before the, the, the actions of God in Hannah's prayer seem to be discriminant, that he was choosing classes of people putting one class down, rising and up, raising another class up. And, and so this would at least confront that interpretation because if he's called the rock, why would he be, why would he be uh, um, uh, not steadfast in justice, okay? If, if he's putting down people, if that's our interpretation, okay? So what I'm trying to give, just to, 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 take, a, to take a step back, I'm trying to give you not only what is being taught, but how we would come to that understanding, a proper interpretation, okay? So God being discriminant would not fit in this context because he's called the rock. And in Deuteronomy 32, when he's called the rock, it's a rock who is always steadfast in justice, 
faithfulness, and righteousness, okay? Everyone's tracking. If someone want to ask a question, everyone's tracking with me right there so far? Okay. Let's go to another passage, 2 Samuel 22, 3. So that was Deuteronomy, which is a different book, but it's in the context of the law, and Hannah is, is, is faithful to the law, so she would be aware of that. But let's go to something closer. Let's go to the, in the, now into the context of Samuel. Let's go to 2 Samuel 22, verse 3. 22, verse 3. Ah, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Uh, so this is the words of David. David spoke these words. Uh, the, the introduction is, and David spoke to the Lord. So this is a prayer of David. <laughs> and David, uh, let me just bring this down. Everyone can see that. And David spoke to the Lord the words, this song, on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So this is a prayer of David, communication with, with Lord Almighty. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God. My rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me, the turns of destruction assailed me. The cords of shale entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice. Cry came to his ears. And then we can just go on and on and on. So um, I don't want to focus on the whole prayer, but we can clearly see this is a prayer of thanksgiving and deliverance. Similar to Hannah's prayer, right? She, she's also praying for a petition, and it was answered, and now she's giving this prayer of thanksgiving. And so I haven't studied this whole passage, but I would, I would assume, if I were to study it, that this would be a prayer of thanksgiving of deliverance, okay? But for our purposes, looking back here, God is called the rock, but now there, there's, he's not only uh, the rock who is faithful in justice, faithfulness, and, um, and righteousness, he is also a refuge and the one who saves. So let's, add, so let's add this idea here. So when we say the Lord, there is no rock like our God. <laughs> what, is, what does David say? David says something a little bit different, but uh, very significant. The rock is used. I think it's used twice. Is it times two? Times two? Came also in verse 47. Of, of Samuel 20. Verse 47, 22, 47. Let's go down there. I got to see this. I did, I, I did not even look all the way down. 22, verse 47. Yes. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. So, yeah, wow. So let's just put, let's just put, Sal, uh, let's just put Samuel 22. It's, maybe it's the whole, yeah, it's the whole, it's the whole, chapter so let's just put the whole chapter and so here we have the rock is now the refuge it's the strong the stronghold the tower whatever you want to say it's uh um my salvation and this word refuge conveys the idea of trust let's go back i want to look i want to take a peek here at this here i want to take a peek here let's go to uh, Psalm 22, verse 1, my, my deliverer, I take ref, Psalm 20, uh, Samuel 22, verse. Here we go. Let's look at this word here, refuge. I take refuge. Okay, so clearly the rock in whom I take refuge. So it's, so, so when you're, when he's using this word, you see in verse 2, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my rock in whom I take refuge. Fortress, fortress is further defining rock. It's not two different ideas, two different, or th here we have three different words. We have rock, fortress, and deliverer. And then it says, my rock in whom I take refuge. The rock is a, is a place of protection. And within that, what is understood is there is, there is trust is, go ahead, Ray, you want to say something? Do you have any idea where, when David wrote that, was it during the time where he was being, um, what do you call it? Sought 
by Paul, uh, King Saul. I think so. I think the introduction talked about when he was delivered by Saul, from Saul. So I think it's when he was on the run by Saul. And there was times where he stayed in the cave. And he could actually be referring Ooh. to the cave when he hid. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of that because yeah. probably that, that would have inspired him to write that the imagery because from his perspective, indeed the rock protected him and it somehow relates to God's provision of protection. Right. And if that's in view, which I'm pretty sure it is, we, we would have to go deep. Um, it's not a small rock. It's a ginormous rock where he can go inside. It's really powerful. And of course, by him going into the rock, He's trusting that the rock will both protect him and hide him. So that's why I'm bringing out that there's really this, there's this trust, imp implied trust. He's putting his trust in the rock to rescue him. So, that, so that's, why, that's why when people talk about there's no faith, there's no trust, in, that's, you're, you're, you're not seeing the bigger picture. You're not seeing how they would use different Im images and what they would do to, to convey their trust in, in the Lord. Uh, clearly, David is trusting in the rock to save him from Saul. And that is, in actuality, the Lord's protection. At no time does he brag about, I found the perfect place to hide. It's, it's the Lord's provision. It's right there. It's the Lord's provision. It's not, there's no boasting. And you see that in Hannah. The boasting is not in my, in ourself. It's, it's in, it's in the rock. It's in the Lord. Okay. Now, let's go quickly. But the image of rock is really brought to its full uh, understanding. There's a lot of other places in, in, in the Old Testament we go to. We don't have time. But let's go to the New Testament now. I want to just go to two passages. <laughs> two passages. Maybe three. If we have time, three. Maybe four. Okay. We're going to go quick here. We're going to go quick. All right. But I want us to see this here because this is so deep. Uh, the first place I want to go to is, is Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. This is the conclusion of Jesus' teaching, okay? Jesus knows the Word of God. The disciples know the Word of God. They know the Old Covenant. They know the Old Testament. Understanding that the rock is always a symbol of the Lord, okay? Look at how interesting Jesus' words are after the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, which is, which is his commands, okay? Everyone who hears these words of mine. Now, Moses will always talk about hearing the word of the Lord. He'll always talk about the covenant. It's always, Moses is always like a, just a means by which the Lord has the authority. It's his law. And Moses is just transferring it. But here, it's now my words. So he, what I'm trying to get, implicitly, there's this idea of authority, something different that Moses does not have different than what any other prophet has. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. <laughs> when the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house. It did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. And so um, in the New Testament, Jesus's words, Jesus's teaching, Jesus's commands is understood as a rock by which we found, we build our house. We know the song, <laughs> the kid's song. Profound truth, though. Uh, it's going to come to full bear. Who is the rock in the New Testament? But I just want, I just want to, to, to set this up here. Now, let's go quickly. Let's move along here to Matthew chapter 16. 16. So this is the great confession of who Jesus is. Jesus said to them, uh, but who do you say that I am? So this is when Jesus is asking the disciples, what are people saying about me? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus, phenomenal confession, phenomenal confession. Christ is anointed one, fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises, literally means Messiah. You could say Christ, anointed one, Messiah, it's all the same. It's all the same word. It's just transliterated. It's brought from Hebrew to Greek to English. That's all it is. So he says, you are the offspring of the woman from Genesis 3.15 that was first fulfilled in the promise of the, the Abrahamic promise of offspring. And that comes to realization in the Davidic. So it's the prototype, the beginning of the Messiah is in the promise, the proto-evangelium in, in Genesis 
314. Okay. And then there's that is being fulfilled through different people. It, it, it comes in the fulfillment and promise in the Abrahamic covenant that you're in your offspring, all the families will be blessed. And then in the Messiah, who is the Davidic, the Davidic offspring, Second Samuel 7. And then in Psalm 2, it's it's very strong. Do you want to go to all these passages or we don't have time? I'll prepare a handout for that. I'll prepare a handout and share that, okay? But what I'm trying to say is that when he says Messiah, what's pregnant in that term, you are the Messiah, it's not just the offspring of David. It's the, it's the promised offspring of Abraham. It's also the, the promise of the seed of the woman who will crush the head of Satan, okay? So that's what he's saying when he says Messiah, okay? Then he says the son of the living God. People debate this and they just say, it doesn't mean divinity, whatever. I, I don't really, we're not, we're not going to debate the liberal, we can argue that. The whole question throughout Matthew's gospel is whose son is Jesus? It comes to climax in Matthew 22 when he asks a question about quoting Psalm 110. And without going into all those details, the conclusion is that he's actually God's son. He's not, he's not the physical son of, of Joseph, okay? Physically. He's actually, the phys he's actually, as literal as we can get, the son of God. And in actuality, he is God. Okay, so son of God is a statement of divinity. Right now, we don't have time to get into that. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is he's, he's declaring him to be the promised man, God himself. <laughs> okay, there's, there's two things going on there. And liberals will say, no, 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 son of God doesn't mean that. Okay, we don't have time to, to, to debate that. What I'm trying to get us to see is that here, the confession of Peter is, you are the promise, you are all the promises, all the promises, Abraham, Eve, and the Davidic promises, and you are God himself. So it's on this confession, Jesus is man, Jesus is God. That's what Peter confesses. And so that's why Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. <laughs> so people say, well, how could Peter know that he's God? Because God the Father revealed it to him, okay? I mean, unless we're going to throw out the Word of God, okay, fine. But if we're assuming inspiration and authority of scriptures, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, because God spoke to Peter. Through, Peter speaks, the Spirit spoke. So watch this, though. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my, but my Father who is in heaven. I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Okay, huge debate here. Huge debate here. I was, a lot of evangelicals, Catholics, Catholics have always taken Peter. Peter equals rock, okay? Peter equals rock, all right? This rock. And a lot of evangelicals now, scholars, will also say the same thing. Jesus was saying, Peter, you are the rock, okay? Now, again, not going into all the, the, the Greek issues and debate. For a period of time, I had actually accepted that interpretation. But upon further study, I was, I was encouraged <laughs> to restudy it. Fair enough. But um, I am very convinced that it's not, Peter is not the rock, both, both grammatically, the Greek doesn't fit that, but also theologically and also contextually. So within the context of, of Matthew, this rock, now, some people will say it's Jesus, but in this context, it's not, I would say it's not even Jesus. And, and the other possible, so it could be Peter, it could be Jesus. Uh, some people say that there was a, there was a, a massive rock where, where in Caesarea Philippi, that, that's another interpretation. But what, what I understand to me, and this is, I'm not alone, is that it's the confession. It's the confession that he's going to build the church. The confession that he's going to build the church is, is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It makes the most sense in the context. In the context, it makes the most sense. And according to, according to uh, Matthew 7, Jesus has already said, on my words, build your house. <laughs> so again, it's, it's not, Jesus wasn't saying, you know, later, of course, Jesus is the rock, we'll see later. But what I'm trying to emphasize is that it's the confession. The church is built. So what I'm trying to get to is that as we are in, in evangelism and, and, and in, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to qualify the confession of faith, right? That he is the 
Yes. So sometimes it would require him enough faith to believe in that. Otherwise, so Paul says in in Second Corinthians, no one. First Corinthians twelve, maybe I could be wrong there, but but Paul says no one says Jesus is Lord unless in the Spirit, unless through the Spirit. Okay. So absolutely implied in the confession is faith and belief, hundred percent. When you confess Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the Living God. When you're confessing it in all its meaning and you're submitting to his lordship, that entails everything else, okay? That, that includes, when you submit, that includes, that would be, the, this confession would be what's in your heart, which is faith. In, in, in your heart, you're believing. Outwardly, you're confessing. So Paul will say, if you, conf if you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he's been raised from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so, so yeah, what's in the heart would be faith, repentance, trust but the physical confession okay what is the confession jesus is the christ the son of the living god that's why iglesia and christo they're not our brothers that's why mormons are not our brothers that's why jehovah's witness and other cults are not our brothers someone cannot be saved someone cannot be a follower of jesus christ if they are not confessing this let's finish here let's finish this context okay i tell you you are peter on this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Let's go back to this imagery. And in the old, let's, let's just look at the Old Testament here. The Old Testament, okay? David took refuge in this rock, and this equaled trust in the Lord. Or we could say the Lord. The Lord was symbolized in the rock. The Lord was not the rock. But the Lord used the rock to protect David. Okay, everyone tracking with me? New Testament, same type of thing. Confession, we must hide in this confession. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the metaphorical rock that we must go inside <laughs> or, or we could say or we could say we're going to stand on it really the, the church regardless this is the refuge now we don't go to a physical rock okay or maybe we should say this equal, yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, it's not literal, but it's the confession. The confession represents the rock. So is everyone tracking with me here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, oh, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 to 11, 12. Can you read it? Verse 10, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we can expand the confession to be Jesus Himself. So we, so we can use different, we can use different um, language. Absolutely correct. So we could even say that this is according to Corinthians three. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the foundation. Let Let's go. Let's go to. Two other passages and we'll be done here. Two other passages and we'll be done here. Let's go to, uh, this, is, this will be much in line with what Henry just read. Great, great passage. Uh, great connection. He, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2.20. We studied this in our class, right? Right, Ray? Remember this? So then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple. So it's more than the church. The church, the church in Matthew 16 is the people of God, literally the people of God. Now it's this, this holy temple. <laughs> so it's more a place of worship. So what I'm trying to see is it's not, it's not one image. It's this glorious multifaceted image of what this rock is. Okay. Uh, it's coming to its uh, full, full fullness in uh, the New Testament. One last passage I want us to go to, and this is going to blow our minds. This is going to blow our minds, but this is going to, to, to really emphasize Jesus' divinity. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses, verse 4. Let's just begin verse 1, okay? For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So he's speaking about the Exodus. So it's the Old Testament before going into the wilderness. And all were baptized into Moses 
in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank <laughs> from the spiritual rock that followed them. That rock <laughs> is Jesus. This was Christ. Was Christ. Was Christ. So the rock in the Old Testament that Moses struck, which is where there's provision. When we look at rock in the Old Testament, you can't just think the Lord, Jesus. <laughs> well, Jesus is present. There are many, there are many examples. Now watch this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna show you where I'm gonna show you how, but let's just continue reading on. I want us to see that. This is this is this might be debated, but a lot of places where we see rock, in actuality, it's the eternal Son of God in the Old Testament. Okay, so let's just keep reading here. Uh, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these took places as, as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written: the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in the single day. We must not put Christ to the test. He doesn't say the Lord. Old Testament, they were putting the Lord to the test. You know, we studied that. Uh, they were putting the Lord to the test in Meribah and uh, Mara. Jesus now says, don't put Christ to the test. Christ is, is placed to the same level as the Lord. Does everyone see that? In the Old Testament, it was the Lord. New Testament is Christ. Okay, everyone's tracking with me there? So what I'm trying to come back to see is that when we see rock in the Old Testament, even though it's the Lord, many times Christ is present there, if not every instance. Does someone want to make a comment, or is that making sense? Tim, what, would, what did Paul mean by do not put the Lord to the test? Or do not put Christ to the test? So, what would be a classic example for that okay so that's where you're putting christ to the test put to put to put the lord to the test in the old testament was they doubted that he was with us they doubted that he was with us and so really when when he says do not put christ to the test you're doubting you're not trusting in christ you're you're, you're doubting in his in his ability you're doubting in his leading you're, you're questioning him so yes, so th that's what it would mean. So specifically, areas of doubt, areas of distrust, areas of, we all fall into this trap. When we, when we grumble and complain, at the end of the day, the Lord put us there. And I'm guilty, I'm guilty. We, we, we all grumble and complain of our situation. And many times we're on that, that thin line of putting Christ to the test. Now we might never say, is Christ among us? But sometimes we feel like that. Sometimes we feel like that, okay? All right, this has gone way longer than I had anticipated. But what I want us to see here is the important importance of this is if you're preaching this text, if you're preaching Hannah's prayer, there needs to be a place where you include the gospel and where you talk about uh, who Jesus Christ is, okay? Everyone in the audience should be uncomfortable, especially if they're unbelievers. So no one should leave, a Catholic should not leave the church service feeling comfortable, saying like, oh yeah, I can do that, okay? Uh, a Jew should not be able to do that, okay? So so what I so the, the reason for belaboring this point is that if I was preaching this sermon, I maybe maybe would preach it in two in two in two sermons, maybe one. But this would be a place uh, in the area of rock. There is none rock rock like the Lord. And talk about the Old Testament context. Just you can go to you could. There's other passages, but I just picked two. And then talk about the full meaning. So for us, what does it mean that there is none? There is none. There is no rock like our God. There is no Christ like our Christ. <laughs> there is, uh, bringing Christ into this into this sermon at this place, I think, would be a great would be a great place to include Christ. It's appropriate. We see that rock is brought to full fulfillment in the New Testament in this image of Christ. So this is a perfect place to include Christ, the gospel, and that we need to be putting our trust and faith in Him. Is everyone tracking? And that's kind of why I, I, I belabored the point, and I, I went for a little bit long, because there needs to be a place, especially in the Old Testament, we're not, we're not forcing Christ in. I'm not forcing Christ in. He, he's there in this prayer of thanksgiving. And we actually see that if we come back here at the bottom, exalt the horn of his anointed. 
literally exhort the horn of his Christ. Same word. Horn, I, uh, anointed Christ, Messiah, same word. So Christ is present in this. You could either talk about it in the rock or you could talk about it down here. I chose rock because of the connection with salvation, the co connection with justice. Is everyone tracking with me? Any questions? Makes sense. Let's, let's go through your verses. And then if I can pull out the, uh, draw some significance. I I'm sorry, guys. This is what longer than I thought. Um, let's, just, let's, let's just go through this. Who was verse three? Was it Ray? Ray, were you verse three? Okay, so Ray, let's, let's go through here. Let's see how many we can do. And then I want to draw an outline. Uh, go ahead, Ray. Well, uh, what are what are the what verbs did you pick up? Here, talk no more. Talk no more is a verb. Now, what kind of verb is that? I I think it's a prohibition. Yes, right. It's a it's a prohibition. Excellent job. And then, what is so very proudly? That would be the object. Okay, so sorry. Sorry, the description for yeah, it, the description. Yeah, so it it couldn't it couldn't be yeah you're good to correct yourself it couldn't be an object because it doesn't give a content it just it's not giving a content so it can't it's yeah. not giving what so it can't be a description so it's going i mean it can't be a, an object so it's go it's it's what you're saying is it's describing this right it's describing this so in the handout if you're to look uh it's most likely you are correct that it's describing so so can you go more specific than describing and what I want to say is uh, manner. The manner in which you speak. You're speaking so pr pridefully. Your, your, your manner is wrong, right? If someone's like, ah, okay, I agree with what you're saying, but your manner is wrong. So you need to change the way you're. Hannah, who is boastful, is correcting someone else who is, who is prideful, right? So what is being, in, what is being, what is being implied here? Because, it, because it's not boastful because Hannah was boastful. So Ray, what what do you think implied by this so very proud so very proud of what, what's your question again? Okay, so up here, Hannah is exalting in the sphere or realm of the Lord. Okay, so she's boasting in the Lord, yeah. which is fine. Here she's she's boasting, but she's correct. So my question is what is she boasting that is inappropriate? What is the sphere that she's likely boasting? boasting about herself yes in, in the context her children she has many children and she's mocking hannah for having none okay so she's boasting in the things that she can't control how many people do you know boast in things that are actually outside their control basketball talent i can't control this henry and i cannot control this danny cannot control your hair ray it's it's, it's a gift or a, uh, a curse from the lord right Someone is like, oh, you're bald. And it's like, did you, did you make your jeans? Are you talking about the other wife? Yes. So How do you know that? Did you already say that? Okay, so Bethany's question, which is a great question, is who is this referring to? Okay. <laughs> now, we don't know for certain who is Bethany, but we do know that, that the, the wife was mocking her right. constantly. And no one else in the context mocked her. So in the story Kanina. uh Benina. yeah Kanina. yes 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 yep he's saying earlier she might oh, what's, what's the first wife again uh P Penina? let me just go to Samuel one okay and what we're going to do later later we're going to to study like a plot trace because this is a, this is a story okay but if we have if we have here so you have the introduction of of El Elkanah he's not the main actor but he's one of the, the primary actors and then the two wives, Hannah and uh, yeah, Penina. Here we have in verse six, her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her mouth. <laughs> so that's the clue. Uh, closed her womb. Yeah, sorry, did I say mouth? <laughs> sorry. So now she's, she's correcting Penina. The second part of verse three, Ray, what do you have? Yeah, so it's, so actually, the technical it would be it would be uh, here, and and and, uh, and here. What kind of verb is that? Command is that a command or a prohibition? Yeah, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's a prohibition. It's a prohibition. Correct. Yeah. And what specifically is? Okay, so what is arrogance? What is arrogance? That should be your object. Yeah, object. 
excellent job. Excellent. You're getting it, Ray. That's what's coming out of the mouth, okay? And then what type, what is this? So we don't have time to go to the chart, but it's just a source. What, what, where, where is the arrogance coming from, the mouth? So, so again, that's why when you combine these two, these two probably suggest she's speaking against. So this is who she's speaking to, all right? She's commanding her. But of course, Bethany is correct in saying, looking at the prayer, of course, it's more than her. It would be for any one of us who are boasting in anything other than the Lord. Second <laughs> half of the verse, second half of the verse. Right. Where is, where is the... Or is, I'm looking or is the progression, uh, rather it's Phoenician for. Okay, yeah, okay. Lord. Awesome. Okay, so uh, let's just work here. Great, great. So this is, a. Uh, I'll just do prohibition. And then this is also prohibition. And then you said this is an explanation, right? Yeah. Explanation. Okay, so this is we're getting we're getting here. We're getting somewhere here. We're getting somewhere here. Okay, so let's look. This is getting to the root. This is getting not the root, but this is getting to the cohesion that makes this entire prayer hold together. Okay, the command is not to speak pridefully. The command is not to let arrogance come from your mouth. Why or for what reason? And you're giving the explanation here. Okay, this is the explanation. So, what are the verbs here? What are the verbs here, Ray? This. Is and what's the other verb? I'm looking at both lines. I'm looking at both lines. So what about down here? Uh, okay. Sorry, For the Lord is God, and by actions are uh, wait, wait. So we have two actions here, okay? And uh, who is the who is the actor? The Lord. The Lord. So do you see how action, Ray? Action is not, and you're correct. Action is not, even though action is the subject, action is not the actor. The Lord is the actor. Now, Ray, what is what is this here? A description of the Lord. Yes. 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 A description of the Lord. So it's what kind of God is He? He is a God of knowledge. And then you did you already, you said this already? You said that this is a progression, right? You said this is a progression. Yeah. yeah. Not only is He a God of knowledge, number one. It's the the by by Him would have fall under by fall as agency uh, by it, or is just the actor by him referring to okay so looking grammatically um, if the, if this verb is passive the actor is never in the okay. subject it's always in it's always in a positional phrase right so this is passive this is passive and so uh, yeah so now, if it was like Jesus or the Holy Spirit, it could be agency because the source is really God. Okay, but here it's it's clearly he's the actor. So this is the Lord. What do we? What's this right here? What's the last word, Ray? You got one more word here. Object. Object. All right. Now, so look here. What's going to set up what is to follow? What's going to set up what is to follow? Is this statement? Okay. Why must she talk humbly and not be boastful and prideful? Why must she not let arrogance come from her mouth? Because God has knowledge. God knows what's in the heart. God knows what's going on. God is a God of knowledge. Okay? And he weighs actions. He judges. We could say this. This is the idea of this is a, a judge. And we're going to see that at the conclusion of, this, of, of the prayer. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Um, so long. We cannot shortcut this. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Let's let's think. So we'll just meet next week. We'll just it's it's let's let me let's meet next week. And um, but I want us to be thinking about. So I've given you really the clue. Uh, verse three, verse three is the key. Contemplate how this affects what is to come. Look, look at look at look at the relationship also with the conclusion and then also one other one other I'm going to give one other thing I want you to look at consider in making an outline consider verb tenses this is concerning time this is so powerful I want you as you look through here if you have time look at the verb tenses the ones that are past the ones that are present the ones that are future I think you'll find something, especially with 
what I'll do is I'm going to share my translation because it's very consistent. I don't know if the, 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 the NIV will be consistent, but, but look at ESV translation and look at the verb tenses. The verb tenses is a key to the outline. I'm convinced of it. I, I, haven't, I haven't translated this all in Hebrew. I have looked at the verb tenses in Hebrew, and it's roughly the same as in English. So I do think that this is very, and it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to look at the verbs. I want you to look at the actor. And I want you to look at verb tenses, if you have time. And I want, there, there should something that should just, there are several things that should just pop out at you. They should just be like, if you look at actor, who the actor is, the verbs, and then also the time of the verbs. Something should come to, re, something should come to view. I'm gonna, I'm gonna print, I'm gonna print out the, the text. I'll, I'm gonna put a text on the, uh, the group page so that you can print it out. So you can see my translation, but I'm telling you, there is something so profound here, and I'm convinced of it. When I saw it, I couldn't believe it because I was looking at the the commentaries, and there's different ways of of organizing the structure. And then when you look at the verb tenses, I was like, oh my goodness. So let's that's a surprise for next week. Um, but the word of God is so deep. I just want to leave you on this. Uh, my one teacher, he was quoting someone else, but he used to say all the time to us, "The word of God is like a swimming pool." It's shallow enough for a baby to crawl in it, but it's deep enough for an elephant to swim. And we are doing ourselves a disservice if we only ever crawl in the pool. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we do not deserve to be in the position that we're in. We don't deserve your mercy and your grace. Father God, uh, we we lift you up and exalt you, and we thank you for being our rock. I thank you for being the rock of faithfulness, of steadfastness, righteousness, while we were unrighteous, while we were sinners, while we were, while we were faithless, while we sometimes put you to the test, Father God. And I thank you for sending your son and, and him giving us the rock by which the church has been built on, the confession that he is the Christ, the son of God the living God. I think about the truth that he's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament, of all the promises in, 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 the, in the word Messiah. He fulfills everything and, and he's calling us to put, put our trust in him. He's calling us to hide, to hide in, in him, Father God. And so I just, I pray that we would just meditate on these truths to, to confess him for who he is and also to, 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 to trust in more than just his words, but to trust in him himself. Father, God, as we leave here tonight, give us the strength to do your will. And I just pray that we would be transformed and conformed to the image of your son. And, and I pray this week that we can, we can live a holy and pure life. We, we want to be led by your spirit to give us strength. I pray for, the, for wisdom for the leaders in Takloban, in the Philippines, around the world, in the U.S., that they would make wise decisions. I pray for protection at the same time that we can get back to the task at hand. And that is to, to see souls saved and brought into your, your, your sheepfold, become followers of Jesus Christ. And we also ask that we would not forget that at the end of the day, we're called to worship. We want to worship you and maybe worship you in our thoughts and deeds. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen.